Okay, I think it's 1.35. I think we're going to get started. Uh, welcome to the Brainiac session. <laughs> um, we have the smartest, the most amazing panel uh, for you today. Uh, and we're going to go through those introductions. We want to make sure that you know that this is interactive. Um, and so uh, you should have cards uh, that you can write questions. And I will get the questions, and then I will uh, use my uh, poetic license as the moderator to merge them together so that we get to as many of your brilliant questions as possible. So please don't hold back because we don't get this kind of panel together very often on probably one of the most uh, uh, more discussion on artificial intelligence and machine learning as a technology than I have ever heard another technology more broadly discussed, right, uh, across government, industry, and academia. So this makes it uh, a, pretty, a pretty special panel. So without further ado, we're going to get to the introductions. Um, first, we have uh, Mr. Brett Vaughn. Uh, Brett is a career cartographer, geographer, a national security, and an environmental science professional. Um, he is currently the AI portfolio lead at the Office of Naval Research. Uh, he has spent the majority of his career at the National Geospatial Agency, but working forward on, with customers um, across defense intelligence, focused on scientific and technical development and concept innovation. Next, we have Dr. Matt Gaston. Uh, Matt is a career computer scientist with a focus on technical innovation and intelligence analysis. Matt is currently the director of the Carnegie Mellon Software Engineering Institute Emerging Technology Center that he established in 2011. He previously he was the director of research at VIG at GDC4 Systems and a technical director at NSA in the Advanced Analysis Labs. Uh, next, we have Jason Matheny. Uh, Jason is an Applied Eco Economics uh, PhD and MBA, the founding director currently of the Center for Security and Emerging Technology at Georgetown, which he established about a year ago. And previously, he was the Associate Director of National Intelligence and the Director of IARPA. And he is a member of the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. And then, last but not least, um, we have uh, E.P. Matthews, who stalwartly is filling in uh, for the CIO of DIA, Jack Gumtow, who literally had to back out within the last hour. Uh, so you're an amazing person, first of all. Um, he is currently um, the chief of end user services at DIA, which is basically all the stuff that any of the analysts or collectors use. Um, and previously was on a joint duty assignment at NSA in enterprise analytics, uh, and is a, uh, was also worked at Bell Atlantic in wide area networks. And so with that, please give a warm welcome to our panelists. Thank you. <laughs> so, so truth to be told, I took my first artificial intelligence course in the mid 80s. Um, the, the, the focus back then was on uh, how much could we do to help analysts with phase one analysis, right, which was processing, and phase two analysis, which was correlation, so that analysts could do third phase analysis, which was, right, prioritization, um, and teeing up of those most likely options uh, to a decision maker. The beauty is it's, it's evolved fast and furious. So what we're going to do is we're going to start out 
with each of our speakers giving a five minute perspective of artificial intelligence from their current mission set and their current background. So with that, we're gonna start with Brett. No pressure, or out of gate. <laughs> uh, thank you, Terry. On behalf of the Chief Naval Research, I wanna thank you and INSA for uh, having us here. As Terry said, I grew up first part of my career in intelligence, so it's a very, it's like coming home here to this forum. The last decade I've spent in Navy science and technology in the last two, three years of that have been dominated by AI. Um, and that, that is now my full-time job. So everyone should know, and if you don't, I want you to know that the Navy has been very active in AI for decades. Uh, we've been a long recognized leader in the science and technology of AI. Our expertise center of gravity is right down the road, about two, three miles at the Navy Center for Applied Research in AI at the Naval Research Lab. Um, wicked smart individuals, they were key players and uh, they helped draft the national AI policy, the DOD AI strategy, and um, just a fantastic group of folks. That's the good news. The bad news is our current AI challenges in the Navy are less science and technology and more issues of adoption and adaptation. And that's where I'll focus most of my comments uh, now and, and later. Um, the potential for AI application in the Navy is quite vast, almost infinite. Pick, pick any job, mission, function, task. There's a, there's a bit of potential there. So the key question becomes, where do we place our bets? Where do we focus if you're talking about something as complex and as technical as AI? Um, so that is driving us, uh, you know, where do we focus our time, our energy, our money, our resources? And what we've learned recently is in necking down in those meaningful areas, strategic frames become critical, very important. And I want to talk about just two of those real quickly here. Um, frames of lexicon and frames of adoption. For the lexicon piece, we learned over the last couple few years, as AI has exploded in the commercial sector, seeping its way into our world, that your definition of AI matters and the way you describe the AI landscape matters. The Navy adheres to the Oxford Dictionary definition of AI, the theory and development of computer systems capable of tasks that are normally associated with human intelligence. Computer vision, natural language processing, machine translation, et cetera. Beyond that, those smart people right down the road have also developed a Navy unique AI taxonomy. Eight areas or types of AI that we are interested are compelling to the Navy and we are in pursuit. They are reasoning, cognition, perception, machine learning, coordination, collaboration, knowledge representation and management, and planning. Um, the last frame I wanna talk about briefly is adoption. Again, where do we focus? Where do we adopt? Adopt is about the what. Adaptation is about the how. So where are we going to place those AI bets? Uh, you will find, if you come to my office, that the areas we are working on now really functions of three things. Priority, technologic opportunity, and a unique Navy need or challenge. And that's really where we're centered today. Um, there's more, but I'll cede the microphone to my team panelists. Go for it. Okay, that was a fabulous framing. Thank you so much. Hey, Matt. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you, Terry uh, and Insa for, for having us. It's an honor to be up here uh, with the panelists. Um, it's a great group. Um, so I I'm, I'm feel really lucky to be here. Uh, I come from a university now, so Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, it's a pretty amazing place to be. Uh, if you're interested in artificial intelligence, it's arguably one of the places that was most involved at the inception of that as, a, as an area of study or a field. Um, famous people like Alan Newell and, and Herb Simon from the very early days. Um, I think Herb Simon's book was The Science of the Artificial. Um, uh, it's worth a read if you haven't, if you haven't read it. Uh, so it's really great to be at Carnegie Mellon University 
Um, not only am I at Carnegie Mellon University, but I'm at the Software Engineering Institute, uh, which has been responsible over the last now nearly four decades uh, for maturing the engineering discipline around this, this amazing thing we called software. Um, 40 years ago, the Department of Defense realized that software was going to be important, realized that it was hard and had a lot of challenges, uh, and, and created the SEI to help um, understand the discipline around the engineering of software and mature that discipline over time. Uh, what's exciting right now is that I think the same thing is happening in, in AI, right? AI has been around for decades. The Navy's been involved in decade, for decades. Uh, I know I've, in, in my professional career, I've been doing AI for national security for nearly 20 years. Um, as far as an engineering discipline is concerned, though, AI is uh, still a craft, uh, still a, a black art at times. Um, amazing people doing amazing things with AI, uh, and in some cases, solving some engineering challenges. Uh, but not getting all the way to a, a mature discipline where we can reliably build, uh, design, build, use, integrate, evolve uh, these types of technologies. Um, and so m my two main points in the introduction, because I actually prefer the questions section of these panels, um, is that AI is not machine learning. Um, machine learning is part of it, uh, but there's a lot bigger scope. I actually like the Navy's framing where there's eight areas. Uh, I've seen a bunch of other framings where there's 10 areas or 12 areas. I know at CMU we have an entire stack of uh, AI technologies that we think about, all the way from the compute level up to human machine teaming and, and autonomy at the top. Um, so when you think about AI, know that it's not just machine learning. And when you think about machine learning, know that it's not just this amazing technology we call deep learning right now. That's the, that's the very popular and, and, and rapidly adopted technology out there in the world. Uh, there's a lot bigger puzzle there. Uh, when you look at DARPA and the third wave, uh, of AI that, that DARPA is promoting. It's the combination of statistical techniques like deep learning with higher level reasoning techniques uh, that maybe were of old that we can now scale uh, and mixing those two together to get advanced capabilities. The second main point is, is that AI, we, there is a need, uh, I think, in the world um, for an, an engineering discipline around, around AI. Um, we're, we're rushing very quickly uh, to capabilities. Um, you know, when it's a recommender system for a movie or a book, it's not very life critical. Um, I'm, I like to make sure I get good books to read. Um, but in other applications, we have life critical decisions that are going to get made, and we need to know how these systems are going to operate, uh, how they might break, um, what about the data that goes into them, and, and whether that data is um, uh, correct or accurate or uh, not filled with bias, uh, these sorts of questions. And so I think there's a whole span of engineering challenges around AI. Uh, the need to come along with all of the research and amazing capabilities that AI re represents. And so with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Jason. Okay. Or back to Terry. <laughs> you got it, Jason. Thanks, Terry. It is such an honor to be here and to see so many of my heroes in the audience. Uh, I um, really feel privileged uh, to be here. Um, I left uh, government after 10 years in the intelligence community uh, to set up a, a policy and intelligence shop housed within a university uh, that can provide free policy analysis and intelligence analysis to the government. Uh, so it's an awesome gig. Uh, and I really do want to make sure that everybody here knows how to reach us so that if you want uh, analysis of uh, what's happening globally in AI, uh, you can reach out to us and, and uh, get our assessments. So if you go to policy.ai, uh, you can find us. Um, we uh, have been looking a lot at the sorts of trends in AI research and development funding, and I want to mention three trends that I think are especially important. Um, one is uh, just how much uh, the um, R&D ecosystem in AI really depends on uh, U.S. federal funding, um, and places like ONR and DARPA and IARPA are addressing the kinds of research challenges that the commercial markets will not address themselves. Uh, to bring up some examples from, um, from IARPA, since I see one of my great colleagues, Seth Goldstein, in the audience, uh, Seth's program at IARPA is looking at how to combine human judgments and machine learning in order to make more accurate geopolitical forecasts. Uh, that's not a problem that the commercial sector is going to take on. Um, and if you look at other kinds of problems, like interpreting uh, satellite imagery, intercepted SIGINT, uh, speech, text, video analysis uh, with, with security events happening within those uh, media, those are things that there aren't going to be well monetized markets around. So we really do depend still today uh, on federal R&D to close the gap on those market failures. 
the other area where I think there's enormous need for, uh, for federal R&D as well as IRAD from industry uh, within the national security sector is in addressing AI security risks. Uh, and Matt touched on this, that uh, a lot of the techniques that are uh, used today were built without intelligent adversaries in mind. Uh, they were sort of innocent. Um, and in some of the same ways that we're now retrofitting uh, most IT systems with security measures that are meant to address vulnerabilities that were baked into systems in the 1980s, or earlier in some cases, um, we're going to have to start baking in security from the start with AI, unless we want to spend billions of dollars retrofitting security years from now. Um, I'm going to give three examples of those kinds of vulnerabilities. The first are adversarial examples. Uh, which is a technique that an adversary can use to confuse a classifier into thinking that, for instance, uh, an image of a tank is instead an image of a school bus or a porpoise. Uh, so it's a way of uh, creating sort of an optical illusion for a machine learning system. A second kind of vulnerability uh, is something called a Trojan, in which you introduce a change into the environment in which a system is learning so that the system learns the wrong lesson. Um, and Jeff Allstott at IRPA has a great program called Trojan AI, looking at how to secure against attacks uh, like Trojans. A third vulnerability is something called model inversion, in which you can uh, reverse engineer the training data that's been used to create an, a machine learning model. Uh, so if you have a bunch of classified data that's going into a model, you really should be protecting the model itself, even after it's been trained, at the highest level of classification that the data used to train it. Uh, that's not always done, by the way, so please be careful with your, with your trained models. Um, it's, it's a little humbling that less than 1% of the AI R&D funding uh, is going towards these areas in AI security, and I think we'll need to increase that. We'll need to increase not only the investments that uh, companies and uh, universities and federal R&D agencies are making in these, but we'll also need to develop national test beds uh, for testing systems against adversarial attacks uh, with intelligent adversaries in mind so that 20 years from now we're not trying to retrofit all our systems with security. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, it's just amazing sitting here, you know, what a small community uh, you are. I, I get to see Ms. Long. Uh, thank you for your leadership at, uh, at DIA. Um, for those who don't know, she was the deputy director, um, and uh, I quickly learned about the value of data, um, you know, working under you. I don't know if you remember this, uh, one of the projects <laughs> I did for you was, hey, how do I retain, um, how do I increase female retention at DIA? Um, more than a decade ago, so I don't know if you remember that, but um, very thought-provoking questions, and it, you know, it helped me learn a lot on the focus on the data. The other piece is, you know, as Jason and I were talking, we didn't realize that we were in the same building working just in a, in a fairly small building, working just two floors apart for multiple years, and we get to, to see each other. So we're <laughs> a fairly small community. So let me talk from, a, from an IT perspective on the, um, one of the things that we're really looking, you know, to solve with uh, AI. So at DIA, we're, uh, you know, we're, AI for us is still at an infancy stage, right, in terms of adoption. I think you talked about um, that in adoption. So things that, you know, we're look, really looking at like, you know, four, four or five things. Uh, and I, I also want to state, you know, uh, if you have ideas in where you could help us, we look forward um, to that. So I think the big things we're looking for is, you know, can I make sense of the data? Within either internal within the same data set or external uh, with multiple data sets, can I, can I make sense of this data uh, right now? Um, you know, can I find a correlation where a human would not even think of asking? And we've seen, as we have started to adopt in small cases, then we're starting to see the advantage that AI brings to us, right? And so things that we would not think about um, in the intelligence community, we're starting to start, you know, we're starting to see, um, starting to find correlations that, you know, a human would not even normally think or an analyst would not normally think. Um, you know, can I make an assessment on this large data, right? Um, large amounts of data just goes untouched. We just don't have the manpower to look at all these, uh, at all these things and make assessments at all this. Can I make an assessment of this large data? At least, you know, at least to a point where I can say, you know, you guys need, an analyst needs to at least look at this. Um, I think that's another area that we're looking at. 
I think the advantage with AI for us is we recognize that, you know, we leveraging these, these capabilities is now we can start to do this at human speed uh, rather, I mean, sorry, we can leverage and do this at machine speed rather than, um, you know, rather than human speed. And, and that's all the difference is, right, between in writing an intelligence report versus writing a history report. Um, and it is, it is that, that time. Um, and lastly, uh, I think the one thing we have noticed is, you know, there's a tremendous growth in volume, velocity, you know, um, in, in terms of data that is being available to us. Most of this data is not human generated, it's really machine generated. It does not make sense for us to leverage the machine to look at machine generated data, right? And so what are some of our challenges, right? How do we work with analysts to quantify known, either known bad behavior, so that we can look for that, or known good behavior, so that we can look for the anomaly in that, in that behavior. So these are some of the things that uh, we are starting to, to look at. Um, um, I really can't speak in the mission space, so I'm gonna focus more on the business space, so like on the back-end infrastructure thing, type things. Um, you know, in terms of, if you look at the infrastructure capabilities, you know, so routers, switches, desktops, uh, servers, um, all these tools are COTS-based products. Uh, all of them, you can start to leverage these tools to identify when things will go down, when things will break. You can get to reliability-based maintenance where you know that something's going to break prior to it breaking, right? We can start to move from descriptive analytics. And right now we are mostly in the descriptive analytics space, right? So I know after something breaks that something, something broke, the dashboard or some customer that calls me and tells me that something broke. Well, how do I move that from a descriptive analytics into predictive analytics? Um, uh, and some of the challenges that we are having is understanding the data, understanding the service decomposition that, you know, a customer will say SharePoint is down, but it's not really SharePoint that's down. It's really one of the subcomponents that make up that service that's down. How do I put those things together? And then once I get to that, then how do I leverage, you know, prescriptive analytics and machine learning? So this is where we are in our journey. We are watching industry. Love to use your help. Made a decision again. Hey, I think you now know that there's no question you can throw at us that we can't handle. So please be thinking of those questions. So what I thought we'd start with, because I love solutions and initiatives, is you all spoke a little bit of framing from your perspective. Are there particular mm -hmm. initiatives that you're working or that you know of, um, especially in the national security arena that we might wanna share? Um, some national security framing. Obviously we had the executive order from February of this year um, about US leadership in AI and the standards, workforce, you know, R&D area. We have the Department of Defense AI strategy for 2019 that was, you know, just on the heels. We have the Joint AI Center, right, that's, you know, just reaching a center of mass. Um, and then we have the IARPA DIVA uh, initiative. I think it's pronounced yeah. DIVA. Okay, thank you, because that's how I would think of it. Um, and then, and then we also have needs, right? What are some of the foundational needs that you have to have in place in order to have uh, an AI capability? The bandwidth, the so solid state storage, the curated data, the interoperability. Um, so we can start with any of you on a current initiative that either you're working or that you're partnering on. Who wants to start? I'll go. Okay. So there's there's really uh, there's three that that I can talk about. So I will. <laughs> Two of them are uh, applied AI efforts. One is more a uh, basic research or um, science of AI related. Uh, the two applied. Uh, well, I'll go back. So if you look at where we have invested largely today. You see AI, at least for the Navy, employed either as an aspect of autonomy in an unmanned system or a decision aid or stripe of decision aid that's intended to increase efficiency in an information-saturated environment to help the human out. So decision aids 
or AI that supports some level of autonomy in, a, in an unmanned system. Um, both of those parent groups, can, you can drill down and uh, envision environments, and I'm going to talk to two. One is human on the loop, one's human in the loop. Many of you are probably familiar with those terms that we're working on uh, that help meet challenges in both those conditions or incorporate degrees of autonomy or decision aids. One is more focused on um, command and control in the Navy. It's more focused on the human and the human-machine partnership. Uh, this is our uh, human on-the-loop example where we're pursuing. If you think about some of the strategic documents that have come out in, in recent uh, times, distributed maritime operations, if you think about the complexity involved with the number of ships, vessels, and entities that need to flow into an area of operations, accomplish a mission, flow out, be supported, one can easily envision where it might be helpful to have the help at machine speed of a recommender or some other decision aid. Um, the other instance is more the um, human uh, I got that wrong. That was human in the loop. This is human on the loop. So the other think a very congested electromagnetic spectrum environment where threats, information are coming at a human at volumes and velocities that will quickly subsume the human. Uh, this is the human on the loop. Uh, real time, you can easily envision an instance at sea where a ship might be threatened um, with from many vectors and decisions need to be made very rapidly. Um, those are the two applied efforts that uh, are a significant part of our portfolio right now. The one science of AI goes back to the more basic research and is starting to scratch at the computational intelligence, the fundamentals of that human machine relationship um, scalability, where does scalability break? Um, how can machines and humans work better together? How can each recognize that the other partner is receiving properly, understanding um, the more sophisticated uh, nuances of that relationship? Um, and then the last thing I'll say is on the needs, um, we in the Navy are very focused on what I'll call, and I've seen in uh, uh, articles, the AI ecosystem approach. So we start with a problem, and then we drill down beneath that problem to determine the relevant ecosystem, the data, the technical infrastructure, the training, the expertise of the people. All of these things are important factors in building a healthy ecosystem in which to drop an AI algorithm. Deficiency in any one or several of those could spell disaster failure for that piece of AI. So when we come at an AI challenge or problem, we are coming at it very problem-specific, context-dependent, and mindfully aware that we have a whole set of underpinning conditions that need to be considered as we away at that. It's a great framing. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I already mentioned um, this sort of, it's not an initiative or a program, but a movement to create a community around AI engineering specifically for defense and national security. Uh, so I won't belabor that. I will say we're, we're looking for partners, interested parties, uh, anyone that can help with that. Um, a, a couple of things that I see that, again, maybe aren't initiatives or, or programs, but they are activities that are, that are out there. Um, I've seen some pretty exciting things happening out of, out of DOD with support from the intelligence community um, with open data challenges. So the curation of, of very large data sets, uh, labeled data sets in most cases, um, where we can get sort of the world of innovators out there to look at problems that are related to, to mission capabilities um, without telling them specifically what those mission capabilities are. Uh, I think of the XView, the XView challenge out of DIU, uh, I think in partnership with the Jake. Uh, it was satellite imagery. The challenge was to automatically uh, localize on objects in satellite imagery and then automatically classify those objects. Uh, 
down to a very fine level of detail. From satellite imagery, can you tell the difference between a, a pickup truck and a flatbed truck, right? Pretty hard, pretty hard problem to do. And that was an open data challenge. Uh, there is a second XView challenge called XView2, um, novel name, uh, on, on the hater project, uh, the hater topic, uh, humanitarian aid and disaster relief. Uh, there they're creating a, a global data set of natural disasters uh, where, they're, where they're labeling um, buildings both pre and post disaster, uh, classifying it by the type of damage uh, and the severity of the damage. So is this a flood, is it water damage, and is it totally destroyed, or is it a fire and, and completely gone? Um, or, or just just barely barely burned at all. Um, so it's a, it's really interesting, and and why I think that's exciting is it's getting so many people to focus on these problems, and then their solutions are shared with with the, the sponsors of, of those challenges. So that's really exciting. Um, related to that is there's a trend out there in the world, right? Academia and industry, and possibly even government, um, uh, on the democratization of of AI, more specifically machine learning. Uh, you're seeing companies, even Microsoft has released recently a, a visual drag and drop tool for, for building machine learning applications. Uh, so that means any of you could go off and, and build, build a machine learning capability this afternoon if you wanted to. Uh, I know my, my son who's 13 and hasn't taken a programming class has tinkered with some of these, these technologies. Um, that's both a very positive thing, it will promote understanding and, and help people um, uh, know what can be done with these technologies, but it also opens up a lot of these questions about, well, what if they don't do it right? What if, you know, what if these things get deployed too soon before they're ready? Those, those kinds of things. And then the last thing I'll, I'll mention, um, because we have a view of it uh, from, the, from CMU, um, DARPA has a program called Software Defined Hardware. Um, and, and the motivation for that program is a bunch of machine learning, AI, graph processing, smart computational workflows um, that are really being used to push the hardware uh, vendors to innovate when it comes to, to hardware technology, computing technology. Uh, and while you don't all, I don't always think of the compute layer uh, when I think of AI, um, to get to the point where we're doing mission scale, mission speed, uh, the hardware's got to come along as well. And so there's a lot of exciting things happening in that community um, that I think shouldn't, shouldn't be overlooked when we're thinking about AI. Okay. Great. I'll talk about other people's initiatives that I'm really impressed by. Um, the first is the White House budget priorities that call out AI, the NDAA that calls out AI. I mean, this is clearly a budget priority, um, and I think we have seen a pretty significant increase in federal funding for AI uh, over the OMB tracks from 2015 to 2018 suggested about a doubling of funding, and it's likely to double again. Um, other efforts that I've seen that I've been really impressed by are coordination efforts, things like the White House AI R&D strategic plan, which I think provides a lot of good fodder for industry and academic researchers to identify the most promising areas of research. Uh, the partnership on AI, which serves as a consortium for industry leaders uh, in AI research, uh, as well as the National Security Commission on AI that I serve on, I'm so deeply impressed by the quality of the commissioners and the staff and the amount of work that they're putting in uh, to help advise government. On the R&D side, the things that I've been really impressed by uh, is the continuing portfolio of research at ONR that historically has been so important in laying the foundation for deep learning. Uh, I mean, we owe such a huge debt to ONR. Um, DARPA's AI uh, Guard program looking at AI security, IARPA's Trojan AI program looking at AI security are, I think, filling vital uh, needs that uh, we have in industry and academia. Uh, and then thinking about the inputs to AI, the four main inputs are human talent, algorithms, data, and compute. And I'm really quite bullish about the U.S. Uh, leadership uh, in all four of these areas in ways that are relevant to national security, but particularly in two of these areas. Uh, in people, the United States continues to attract uh, and frequently retain the best and brightest computer scientists who come here uh, to study and later decide uh, to live and work here for the rest of their lives. So doubling down on that advantage that we have, uh, that's a, a comparative advantage for the United States culturally and historically, uh, by making sure that people can immigrate here uh, and contribute to our economy is, I think, a real key policy need. Uh, a second natural advantage that we have right now is in the area of computing. Um, we have a pretty strong advantage uh, relative to our main competitors in being able to uh, design 
uh, and fabricate uh, leading edge uh, chips for machine learning, GPUs, as well as machine learning ASICs. And I think that's a really important strategic advantage that we should, we should maintain. We, along with Japan and the Netherlands, also control about 80% of the market for semiconductor manufacturing equipment. And this, this really is uh, such an important input into everything else that drives the future of, of machine learning. Uh, the one area I want to highlight that I think that we're weakest in and where there might be really big bang for the buck by making some investments uh, is in test beds and, and benchmarking. Uh, we really don't have a great way currently of measuring the performance of machine learning systems uh, across a variety of operational data in operationally realistic conditions, seeing where they break and how they break when presented uh, with novel attacks. Um, we also don't have a great way of benchmarking the performance of, uh, of foreign systems. Uh, the best work that I've seen comes out of the AI index uh, that's uh, co-published by Stanford, as well as the MLPerf site, which does benchmarking tests of machine learning chips. But I think that's an area where we really need to invest more. You don't have to. Okay. <laughs> So, only if you want to. So I, I can speak on some of the initiatives that are needed for us um, at DIA to get to that, you know, to get to this level. Um, again, speaking specifically on adoption. Um, so a big initiative for DIA is MARS, uh, Machine Assisted uh, Learning. Um, a, our lawyer came specifically and said, do not speak on this. So I will not speak on that because of the acquisition process that we're going to go through. But you can Google it and you will see it. Um, and it's a big effort and one of our top priorities for our director. Also, it was spoken to at your recent conference, and yes. so there yeah. is some information yep. out there on it. Yep, it was spoken, okay. yeah, it was spoken at, the, at, the, at the DOTUS conference, but yes. But it's M-A-R-S, correct? Yes, yes. Okay. M-A-R-S. Um, but how do, we get, you know, how do we get to that, that, um, that level? So that is one big initiative. So one of the things that we see as a challenge is that, you know, everyone comes to the IT folks, hey, I want to do artificial intelligence, I want to do machine learning, I want to do these things. And we have no clue how to do it because what we're missing is that vertical domain expertise of an analyst, right? Um, so we can, we can do IT-related things, so I can pull data, I can decompose data, but I can do like what the data standards should be, uh, you know, what should be the data classification. Um, I don't know because I'm not partnered with an analyst, I don't know what necessarily the analyst is looking for. Like, how do I get that known bad behavior? And so in order to achieve that, one of the things our CIO is doing is he's really um, proposing a shift in terms of creating like a pyramid. And that, this was pyramid. He showed this pyramid at our, our DOTUS conference uh, recently. And what he said is, hey, I'm going to focus on the core infrastructure services that enable you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I really want our mission partners, so that is the DI and the DO, um, right? I want them really to focus on building the analytics and the visualization of those capabilities. Um, and this, and there are going to be a place, of course, a, a hybrid where that's done in partnership. And I think this is a, for us, this is a seismic shift because, you know, you had previously, you had the IT folks here. They, as we went through budget cuts and sequestration in order to gain efficiencies, um, you know, we had consolidated all the IT um, into one, and, and we saw significant gains of efficiencies. But as we start to move into the ability to leverage data, we, in DIA and, and in other organizations, we really have to partner with our, with, our mission, with our mission partners so that we can leverage those capabilities, right? So beyond, like, you know, beyond the initiatives that were spoken to, right, you know, what are the things that we need to do at DIA? So one of the things that we're looking to do is how do we shape the workforce? To achieve this because the people we've hired are not necessarily people who are experts in this and this also when you look across the directorates uh, this is not exclusively a CIO or an IT problem but really it is how do we collectively as an agency solve this right so maybe there has to be a shift in terms of data swimmers is not an exclusive knowledge within IT but within DI and DO um, or SNT or science and technology and, and, and different directorates. Um, and how do we, we might have to move from hiring just political science um, analysts to people who are electrical engineers or system engineers and train them on the 
tradecraft capabilities. And so those kinds of shifts are what's taking place that previously, you know, we didn't factor in because we need that domain vertical expertise that, you know, and be, to be partnered uh, with the IT expertise. Um, I think the other aspect is in, in terms of shaping the workforce, one of the things our CIO has said is, hey, he wants to hire 80 to 85% um, you know, people with STEM backgrounds. Um, and so these are the kinds of some of the, some of the internal initiatives that um, in terms of shaping workforce, culture changing, culture changing, partnering across uh, and outside CIO, we are looking to partner with uh, academia and send people to academic institutions from um, our organization for a year or two so they can see and learn things that we cannot and bring those standards of excellence internally. Um, and so those are some of the things that we are looking to do in addition to the mission initiatives mentioned earlier. Okay, thank you so much. Um, several of you brought up adult adoption culture um, and, and frankly, uh, you know, having my own uh, company that leverages and partners with over 250 um, AI and machine learning commercial companies out there today, um, I actually find culture and adoption when I'm meeting with industry customers or <laughs> government customers is often the biggest hurdle. So as development and research and transition folks yourself, um, what are your, some of your ways of getting them to think differently about the risk of AI algorithms, the risk of commercial AI capabilities and tailoring those, um, the importance of different ways of uh, OTA, RFPs, you know, other ways of uh, piloting and transitioning and doing it more quickly. Um, and, just any takeaways on how to promote that adoption? Anyone want to start? <laughs> I didn't mean to make it so hard. I'll go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Last time. And we can so just we'll... do we can just do one or two responses and yeah. move on. <laughs> so I talked about adoption and adaptation, and 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 the question I heard. Um, more adaptation, and, and this is critical. To be effective in the AI space, um, there really is going to be a necessary series of shifts made in business mode, in development, in delivery. And those shifts have a very unique nature and velocity compared to what we're typically used to. Um, there's a... Um, so how I make it compelling when I'm talking with someone and go back to mm -hmm. what EP said about the domain expert, that's absolutely vital and critical. And I try and draw a relation to something or a, a, a scenario or a condition that they would be familiar with uh, and make the distinction that way. But in our, um, there's a great article I would point everybody to, I'll give credit and permission to Dr. Chris Demchak at the Naval War oh, College. Yeah. Um, her article, The Four Horsemen of AI Conflict, she does a very mm -hmm. good job of describing some of the dynamic forces in play. And those forces, if you embrace them and master them, you will find it much easier to effectively adapt and make that adaption. Mm -hmm. If you ignore them, you do so at your own peril and you will probably be trampled underneath. Um, her four horsemen are scale, speed, strategic coherence, and especially for this group, uh, sine qua non of strategic powers, foreknowledge. I've recently talked to her about it, this, tweaking her intellectual conceptual model for the Navy's use. She gave me permission. <laughs> My four horsemen of Navy AI are scale, speed, coherence, and resilience. And that resilience piece is, mm -hmm. when I talk about that ecosystem, we've talked about adversarial AI and things of that nature. How resilient is the thing you've created, that very fragile ecosystem? Is it resilient in the face of either environmental or technological degradation and conditions? Is it resilient in the face of malicious intent or otherwise, you know, bad actors trying to mess up your algorithm. Um, but okay. I think, uh, yeah, ad adaptation okay. is huge. Okay. Um, I'm going to switch gears. We have a couple of questions. 
um, about, you know, where do we think China is um, on AI? Where do we think Russia is, uh, Europe? Um, so I thought I'd go to the, the two uh, folks who are in the middle who uh, have, uh, have interaction with foreign students, foreign research, da 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 Do you have a sense of where uh, those other uh, peer competitors are vis-a-vis -vis us? Um, so uh, Russia, I think uh, what's, what's most unique about Russia is its risk tolerance for fielding systems quickly uh, that haven't been tested very well. Um, <laughs> and uh, so that means there's a whole lot of misadventures out there with, uh, with weapon systems. Um, I think the, the overall quality of AI research in Russia is, is very low. Uh, it's, it's not in the top 10 uh, globally of talent. Um, it's, it, it just doesn't do well on any of those four measures of capability that I mentioned, uh, people, algorithms, data, or compute. Um, but it does show a, a willingness to field systems, uh, perhaps before some of its competitors. Um, China is a much closer competitor uh, to the United States. Um, by some measures, it maybe has one third or one half the capability by various kinds of schemes of looking at uh, the quality of research, the impact of the research, um, but it does have ambitious plans. Uh, it's very hard to tell how, how much of those ambitious plans actually translate into real funding uh, and funding and good research as opposed to uh, good money chasing bad and some of the, uh, the so-called uh, chosen national champions, the Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent companies. Uh, which aren't always especially cost-effective in their, their research enterprises. Um, they have a very hard time uh, attracting uh, immigrants. Um, they have a hard time even attracting their own human talent. Mm -hmm. um, and m many of their best computer scientists um, come to the United States uh, and want to stay here. A recent analysis by Macro Polo showed that of the uh, computer scientists with Chinese affiliations, uh, that were accepted into NeurIPS, the sort of leading uh, deep learning conference, uh, about 75% of them uh, were no longer in China um, uh, a few years later. Um, so really there is a, a potential for a massive brain drain from China uh, out to other centers of AI research like the United States, Canada, and the UK. Uh, and we should be leveraging that. Uh, we should be doing everything we can in order to uh, help encourage that brain drain uh, so that we doubly advantage ourselves by having that brain power and also uh, costing our competitor from losing that brain power. Uh, in microelectronics, China is also behind. Um, SMIC, which is their largest uh, indigenous foundry, is several nodes behind the state of the art. Uh, it has a very small supply chain relative to uh, others like uh, TSMC or even a uh, place like Global Foundries. Uh, so we really do have some, I think, substantial advantages. China, though, can catch up. Uh, so uh, even though I think uh, the United States has a strong lead, we can't be complacent. We have to make sure that we are investing uh, in R&D. Uh, we have to make sure that we're maintaining competitive markets so that we can draw on one advantage we have. Uh, we need to make sure that we do capitalize on our ability to attract and retain the world's best talent. Um, I, I, I think Jason actually nailed it, so I won't say much more. Um, I, I will mention that I've been to the, there's a big conference in AI called AAAI, or the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. And over the last three years, um, both participation and number of submissions from China have been greatly increasing. Uh, this year, I think more than 50% of the submissions came from uh, Chinese universities. Um, the observation that I have is that the acceptance rate of those papers was is still lower than acceptance rates from say U.S. universities or other countries. I actually think Italy, strangely enough, has, has the highest acceptance rate, but very few number of submissions. Um, so I think you're seeing a rise of activity in, in China. Uh, and the, the, the quality, while it's not maybe at the, at the level of what we're seeing out of U.S. universities, it's creeping upward, right? Over the last three years, that submission rate or, or acceptance rate uh, for Chinese publications has been growing. Um, my caution here in the, in the national security community is AI and, and machine learning is definitely an, an international discipline, a global discipline, and there is innovation mm -hmm. happening everywhere. So 
while it's important to keep our advantage over the rest of the world um, uh, and, and maybe limit or, or, or maximize the brain drain, depending on which side of it you're on, um, we, we still have to pay attention to the whole world. Uh, there's a lot happening out there uh, that, that's valuable for, in a lot of different sectors of the economy, the, the defense and national security space, et cetera. Okay. Thanks so much. Those were great perspectives. Um, we only have about 10 minutes left, so I wanted to do um, one more question and then, uh, or I, no, I guess we've got more time. It's 2.45? Okay, sorry. We have more time. Never mind. Um, I... This is a question I would ask, but, uh, but someone else is asking it. What are the best ways for uh, commercial AI solutions, and they underlined real AI solutions, to get in front of your respective uh, organizations or to partner uh, together? So how, how do they get in front of uh, you folks? Um, I think for us, it definitely starts with education. Um, so one of the things that we are looking to do is to not just educate um, the IT workforce, but also educate the organizations to the left and right of us, right? I think um, one of the things I noticed um, when I was at NSA is I have system engineers, I have software engineers, I have electrical engineers in their version of, you know, it, it was not exclusive to the, um, the IT organization, it was across. You don't see that um, at DIA, um, right? So I think that it starts with that, right? How do we, how do I change the, and shape the workforce so that everyone is a data sw data swimmer? I think the second thing is is a cultural change in the adoption of risk. So for me, on the business side, it's okay for me to take a risk because I'm looking for a decision advantage. Um, when I talk to my mission partner. Um, they make it very clearly, hey, you know, I'm talking about, you know, warheads on foreheads. I cannot be wrong. And I cannot guarantee um, your algorithm, right, and they're referring to not me specifically, but they're referring to the, the AI algorithm. You know, if you cannot explain it and articulate how you came to it in terms of a rational, in terms of the rational use uh, behind it, they don't trust it because it's a reflection of their brand, right? Um, and if you if think of this in such a way, hey, DIA put out the wrong intelligence, it affects the brand of DIA. So if you want to use real AI, I think it's the education and uh, the analysis of how you got to that secret sauce so that you can create that decision advantage. I think that's what's missing for us. Okay. Thank you. Brett, how do, how do folks get in front of you? <laughs> <laughs> Or your, or your organization. Sure. So I'd, I'd say the first thing you do, I mentioned the, the Navy AI taxonomy. You, you get a hold of that and, and at least become familiar with it at a high level and think back where you come from and how you think you can, you can help advance any one of those areas. It's out there on the Internet. If you, if you Google Naval R&D AI taxonomy or Navy AI taxonomy, you should be able to find it. If you can't, you can tap me on the shoulder and I'll, I can provide you a copy. It's publicly releasable. Um, we regularly, of course, put out announcements and fed biz ops and BAAs. Um, we have uh, one coming out soon on the related to the science of AI I talked about earlier. Um, we have a small business office. Those are great folks. They're always good to engage if you're interested in talking. We're starting to get a better about the more non-traditional and agile acquisition vehicles, the OTAs, the IDIQs. We're seeing that more often. We're starting to ramp up engagement in consortia. Uh, that we're seeing a lot of good work come out of those groups. And uh, for AI in particular, there are several Navy entities or activities that that could allow you access to the right folks and to key and Navy initiatives. And the one I'll mention is the Cruiser uh, outfit at the Naval Postgrad School. Cruiser is an acronym, the Consortium for Robotics and Unmanned Systems Engineering and Research. It's open to industry, government, academia, anyone can join. They have a regular drumbeat. It's a great way to just open the door and see who's working on Navy autonomy and AI issues. Okay, great, thank you. 
Um, so I'm, I'm combining uh, several questions, but the whole focus is on, um, you know, to what extent does, is AI wholly dependent on the optimal infrastructure? Uh, and so other parts and pieces to that is um, do, and I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm just going to phrase it, it, you know, how does cloud computing play in? What is the next big hardware innovation, you know, that is foundational to AI? Um, and, and really, what is the ideal infrastructure platform today for AI? And is there something coming around the corner that's, that's that next piece? Um, Matt, you want to start out? <laughs> uh, briefly. Um... Uh, there is no ideal. It all depends okay. on what you're trying to do. Okay. Um, uh, that, I'd, I'd say the same thing, right? I, when I go and talk to companies or, or government organizations, they say, give me, give me some of that machine learning um, <laughs> or, or give me some of that compute environment for doing machine learning. Um, the question really is, what's the problem? What do you, what's the mission capability you're after? What's, what's the data you, you have to, to make decisions? Uh, so always start with a problem. Um, I think that's really the only answer I'll give here is that it, there is no ideal, there is no perfect. Um, yes, cloud computing can be used, should be used uh, for various applications. There is exciting things happening in the hardware space. Um, I can't remember the name of the company, but there was a chip that just came out that's a thousand times faster than a GPU or something like that, um, packing more and more uh, compute into a single chip. Uh, so there's always innovation happening. Uh, don't strive for ideal, um, strive for what works for your problem. Uh, and then always be look out, uh, be on the lookout for new technologies coming along the line. Okay, Jason. Yeah, I think um, hardware is so interesting how rapidly it's it's changing. A recent analysis by OpenAI suggested that the amount of compute that's being used in leading edge AI experiments is doubling about every three months. Uh, so the hardware space, I think, is likely to be really exciting over the next uh, decade. And whether that's means in increased improvements in GPUs or machine learning ASICs or FPGAs or cryogenic computing uh, or you know, quantum accelerators or all of the above, um, I think it'll be very hard to predict uh, which of those combinations of hardware innovations uh, are likely to be dominant, if any of them will be dominant. It might just be a, um, a fairly sort of openly uh, divided infrastructure. Um, I think the most important infrastructure, though, is the geopolitical infrastructure. Uh, and the, the biggest advantage that the United States has in global leadership is its global alliances with the other leading countries in AI, countries like uh, the UK, uh, Canada, um, South Korea, and Japan, uh, and maintaining those alliances um, both so that we can share talent, we can share data, we can share innovations and compute. I think that will end up proving uh, more valuable over the long term than any specific uh, innovation in infrastructure. Okay, great. Um, so we we want to do you know closing remarks across everybody, but there's one question that keeps coming up, um, which is you know what what are those first couple of steps um, that you have to take if you're a non-big um, budget IC entity? So let's say um, I, I am not using AI today. <laughs> I have an intelligence, an important intelligence function. How, how do I get started? You know, how do I get that those foundational pieces in place. What are the questions that I need to be asking um, as that point of departure? Um, so if you want to do that question and then and then wrap in your closing uh, thoughts, that would be awesome. Brett? Okay, I'll, uh, I'll steal Matt's thunder because he said it well. Uh, from our perspective, it all starts with the problem and problem curation getting good fidelity on the problem you're trying to solve. And then I would grab your, your nearest and dearest AI expert and, and look at the, the scope of AI tools and techniques that are out there to start a meaningful and impactful road to effective AI. But problem curation is it's becoming, um, I think all the services are becoming acutely aware of how important and difficult that can be. But it does start with the problem. It does not start with AI. Um, and in uh, wrap up, I'll just say that um, 
know that the Navy has been active. We are making a shift, a uh, more concerted effort on adoption and adaptation to build on our recent success in the technology and in the lab. We do believe there's a wealth of capability in the lab environment that is ready to go into the field and experimentation and prototyping that was mentioned as well. We know that's going to be a, that should be a priority and we're, we're going there. And that, you know, for me as a Navy employee, there are a lot of people wringing in their hands about AI. Um, I'm not one of them. I feel duty bound to put the most advanced technology in the hands of our sailors and Marines to protect them and to make sure they can do the most efficient job, whatever it is, whether that's at sea or in the back office. And I see a tremendous potential for AI to help in that regard. Okay. So thank you. Before we continue, thank you. Um, uh, I just got hit up side the head again um, that we didn't discuss ethics um, in all of this. So if, as we go down, you want to weave that in, you're more than welcome to do so, and we can circle back with you, Brett. You don't have to. So, okay. <laughs> but if you want to not deal with that one, that's good, too. Um, who would like to go next? Okay. Go. Um, so, uh, yes, um, Brett said, reiterate and start with the problem. So assuming uh, on getting started with AI, if you're not a, a, big, a big budget IC agency, um, if you have the problem, that's, that's a great start. Uh, and also assuming that you have access to data and access to compute, because those solving those problems is not, a, not really a technology problem. Um, it's being able to access the resources that are available to you. And then from there, I would actually say it's not a big budget item to get started. Um, there are tools, there are technologies, there are people that can help you get started for very low cost. Now, how far you can go at very low cost is, is maybe an open question. Uh, but you can get started, and I would encourage you to be uh, experimental, to, to, to practice iterative incremental development, to try things out, to see what works, what doesn't work. Uh, again, assuming you've got the problem, you've got the data, and you've got the compute infrastructure uh, and can use it, um, then you can get started pretty, pretty quickly. Um, ethics. Uh, I will say, of, of course, ethics matter in this space. There are interesting questions. I think going back to Jason's opening remarks, when, when you look at these machine learning capabilities that are becoming so popular, uh, they can be attacked in, in interesting ways. They can have bias embedded in them that's, that's hard to detect. Um, uh, they can uh, compromise privacy in, in, in interesting ways. So I think you know, ethics is a, is a first order consideration. Uh, as we roll out, there's no magic solution to this. I think we need very, very smart people thinking about the, the ethical implications of all of these technologies as we go. Um, we also the technologies are going to be changing and advancing very quickly, so I think that's a it's a constant battle. Um, uh, and then and then parting thoughts. Um, I'll simply say I've been around these types of technologies for for 25 years now. Um, uh, I'm an AI optimist. I think there is amazing opportunity um, to do great things, uh, to change the world in very positive and, and impactful ways. Um, uh, and I'm less I less subscribe to the fear of AI. Uh, I largely think that comes from um, maybe not being completely informed about how these technologies work uh, and what they're capable of. And so at least for the near term, uh, I'm an optimist. Uh, I would promote the adoption of these technologies in a very smart and methodical way. Okay. Thanks, Jason. Uh, just to build off of what Matt said, I think if, um, if, you, if you use the, the tools that are uh, frequently available open source, you can make a ton of headway really quickly. Uh, my only mm. su suggestion on top of that would be if it's an open source tool that you're expecting to be attacked, uh, either build your own red team internally so that you can um, start to test the, your system against attacks, or take it to Matt at SEI, <laughs> or take it to NIST, or take it to a national lab so that they can attack it for you. Uh, because I, I think if, if, we, if we are building systems that are going to have intelligent attackers, the first thing they're going to try is uh, is looking at probably what open source code libraries you might have borrowed from that have already well-known uh, attack surfaces. Um, I think the opportunities for uh, the United States to lead in AI ethics uh, are, are really important. And I was really impressed by uh, the DOD Defense Innovation Board's work on AI ethics. Uh, I think recognizing that uh, for the United States to lead globally in AI, we will need to lead in AI ethics. 
uh, for a number of reasons, but I think the most important of which uh, is that um, the computer science community globally cares deeply about this and will move to the countries that care deeply about this. Uh, so if for no other reason than just the uh, maintaining a strong workforce, this is something that we need to take seriously, in addition to all the reasons of, of finding uh, uh, principles that are resonant with, uh, with our broader uh, values. Um, the only thing I want to uh, close with uh, is just gratitude that you all took uh, time out to hear about AI. I know there's enormous interest in this topic, um, lots and lots of different sources of information. Uh, I'm just grateful to have been uh, here in a panel that's so thoughtful about them. Hey, Thank you. Um, Take it home. Okay. So <laughs> I'm going to give from the government perspective, right? So these are academia and really smart, bright people. Um, you know, what does it take? Um, so I'm going to give you, uh, I think, something unique that I found out. Number one, go find a senior champion who truly believes that failure is okay. All right? So what's missing for us is patience, right? What gets measured gets done. When was the last time you wrote, you, you know, you saw a senior executive write, hey, here are all the projects that I failed on, right? And if you don't find a champion that's willing to embrace failure, you will never see a person who embraces and passionate, who embraces and who's passionate about AI because you will never be successful in your first AI project. I've seen it. I've done it. I failed multiple times. I created the Big Data Award. It was the Big Data Award was the person who took the biggest risk and failed the biggest. And I gave them a time off, a three-day time off award, and I did it publicly, right? Because we are a very risk-averse culture. And in the backdrop of having rank in person where you celebrate your success, this is not an environment that you know, is conducive for that. So number one, I would start with finding a championship in which if you're starting small, right, where failure is okay. Number two, I would, for the vendors, right, I would say stop speaking in system terms, start speaking in mission outcome terms, mm. right? So when I hear questions like, hey, what, what's the best platform? What's the best, you know, should I be using cloud computing? Or like, should I, you know, you're not solving the problem because your mission person, the vertical domain expertise that is needed, does not understand any of that stuff. I think uh, number three is a, a technological shift has taken place. So think about, I remember this, uh, uh, um, you know, it was a massive event at my house when King Charles and, or Prince Charles and, and Lady Diana got married. You know, everyone got up very early and it was a big event. Um, today, Anyone can live stream on their, from their Twitter account, right? So what costs millions of dollars today, or millions of dollars you know, 30 years ago is very possible today, and because the adoption of services are, is capable, right? So in order to get started, as, as Matt, you said, it's very possible. But the harder part is not the technology, it's the understanding the data and the cultural change of accepting patients that you cannot get to to AI right away because I am the recipient of the question that Matt asked. Hey, you know, mission guys, I want to do machine learning and AI. What can you get me? But they cannot articulate the problem they're trying to solve. Okay. Hey, are they amazing or what? Round of applause. Thank you so much. <laughs>